Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see you all. Keith from the Education Department, also the faculty development team. Welcome to Primetime at the BU Library. Primetime is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, the faculty, development, and many other offices on campus, celebrating learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. Join us on Tuesday, March 19th. When Dr. Rollin King and Sarah Redman Leo share their research on chiral molecules. I believe that's chiral. Got any science people in here? All right, chiral molecules. And their central role in the quest for new medical drugs and chemical catalysts in predicting the optical rotation of solvated chiral molecules via explicit solvent effects. Can anybody explain that to me? <laughs> All right. I'll be here next week. I'll be here next week, exactly. <laughs> Today, we welcome Chris Garrett, professor of history, as he shares his experience as an academic blogger and how it connects to his scholarship and teaching. Let's welcome Chris. Hey, Steve. Um, welcome to the Thursday Tennis Party Library, the Chris Garrett Show. <laughs> There's a little bit of Ricky attendance from last week. I'll be here next Thursday. Uh, it's spring break. Glad to be here. <laughs> Observational humor. We'll do a little improv. Um, it's good to be up here uh, talking to you about blogging uh, here today. When I was filling out the form to sign up for the session, I, they, they give you different headers that you can use. And I think I did, I don't know if I did anything actually. I think it came out as High Cloud Scholarship because that's one of the things. What I was looking for was the not ready for prime time header that we used to have because this very much will fall under that heading. Um, I, I, I will have no problem saving time for questions today because I will be vamping with Bill like 25 minutes or so. We, I just wanted to, to give a kind of informal progress report on something I decided to experiment with. Starting a little over a year and a half ago, in the summer of 2011, I thought one of my summer projects would be to start a blog. Um, we had had a false start with this maybe 2005 or 6. In CWC, we had started talking about social media, about this and that coming, talking about podcasting. And so we set up a podcast that ran for several years. We also set up a little known, little red blog that lasted for maybe three months um, that a few of us wrote things about spiritual formation on and traditions. Um, I'm sure it exists somewhere out there. I heard like finding it. Um, it just seemed like a lot of work. And I, was, I just didn't have time for it. I, it was hard to tell if there was any interest. There wasn't much engagement, and so I dropped it. Uh, but then I thought, let's be a fun thing to try for the summer. I'll start a blog. And uh, here I am, a few months later, still, still doing it. So I thought I'd just take you through uh, the now two blogs that I write for. Um, describe a little bit of what I do on them if you haven't read them before. And I'll try to connect this back to my scholarship and my teaching. Um, share a few proposals, at least, for why I think this is a beneficial thing for faculty and others to engage in, but also I think for a couple to invest in. So um, my personal blog is called Pie to Schoolman. It's inspired by an essay by a, a covenant historian at Earth Park called Zenas Hawkinson talking about this, this interesting mixture of uh, personal piety and then the life of the mind, the life of learning, which connects really well to my research, which is primarily about pietism in Christian higher education and places like Battle and Earth Park. So um, after a couple of other things can seem they seem either too clever or not clever enough. I went with this, and it's, it's not. Um, as of this Wednesday, I think I've written about 640 posts or so. So that ends up being an average, according to Google Reader, about six a week. So I try to blog daily except for Sundays. Um, and then once in a while, I'll do a shorter post later in the day. Um, at first, it worked really well because I had saved up about three weeks of posts. I thought, it's easy. <laughs> put it up in the morning, go off, enjoy the rest of my day. And then the school year started, and it's like, uh oh. And, um, at that point, you build up expectations. So my first piece of advice to any would-be bloggers out there is to set for yourself a goal and stick to it. It doesn't have to be blogging daily. It also doesn't have to be an average length of my post, which is usually 500 to 1,500 words, um, and often going over 1,000, which is, um, I think, on the longer side. So I, once you do it, though, you, you're kind of stuck with that. Your, your readership expects that. It's hard to change. Um, but I also enjoy that, and I'll talk about why I find that a valuable, a valuable exercise. The subtitle that I gave to this was uh, Exploring Christianity, History, Education, and the Ways in Which They Intersect. Um, so one classic piece of blogging advice you get is that you don't just write about whatever you want. You try to identify certain themes that you return to relatively frequently. So these seem like three important ones. 
and it seemed to give enough space. Christianity covers a whole lot of ground, so it can write a lot of a lot of things there. History, likewise, and then education. But they also connected with my research, with my teaching, with my experience here at Bethel, my connection to my church. And so they seemed like good places to start, and they've been the most popular categories, especially Christianity and history. Come up with maybe a third of the post each have been under that heading. Um, but there have been a few other things over time that have developed. I tend to write a lot about books, about 80, some books have been about books of some sort. Um, and then I also do a Saturday links post, which is a pretty common blogging practice that I just called that was the week that was. It's, it's a way to go through links that I didn't really want to write a lot about, but in those areas of Christianity, history, education, and sometimes some other things, I kind of give brief comments and then suggest here's some other things to look at. And that's not really the focus of my blog, but I wanted to mention that that's a very popular way of doing academic blogging. Uh, <coughs> Jana Reese is a Mormon writer and editor and blogger. And she wrote this very nice uh, um, three-part series on why you blog. And the one point she made that really stuck with me is that a blogger is a curator of ideas. You know, to be a blogger, you also need to read pretty wide. I have not used an RSS feed. I have used Google Reader until I started blogging. It's actually forced me then to read a fair array of other blogs, websites, publications. And, and then to do that with a filter towards what are some ideas that I should try to introduce to the audience. And so I do this mostly through the links post, and then occasionally I'll pick out something to reflect on the engagement. But there are some really good blogs out there by academics that are more dedicated towards this on a daily basis. Um, Scott McKnight's Jesus Creed is probably the best example of this in the evangelical world. Scott's a biblical scholar who just moved to Northern Seminary. Um, his blog is, has huge traffic. It's probably one of the top ten, um, certainly Christian academic blogs. And he doesn't tend to write a lot himself, but he's trying to point his readers towards different posts, different topics. People who read his books would find interesting. And over time, he's built up this pretty impressive community. So unlike most blogs, if you read Scott's blog, everything's got several dozen comments on it. Now often the comment section is really where the meat of it is. So you get these conversations, and you read it, it's a very diverse community. He's got some deeply conservative folks, he's got some very progressive folks interacting, usually nicely with, with each other, and he tries to please that people. So I think that's the curating idea. Um, another that I'll mention is John Pia, who's my office member, is chair of the history department at Messiah College. Um, John also does this type of approach. He blogs every 60 to 90 minutes is his goal. But usually he doesn't add a lot of commentary, but he's pointing to something in education, especially in Christian colleges. Um, history, and especially public history in American history. And once in a while, the world has a job place on Christianity. He doesn't have quite the number of commenters that Scott does, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, I it's not quite like that. I do a lot more commentary, ask a lot of research, um, more fall training. Uh, and then there are other things that come up. You really have nothing to do with my state of themes. And this is just what happens when you've got six posts a week to fill up. You just write about anything. Sometimes it's not very serious. Uh, at the end of the summer, I wrote something about the beard that I was foolishly trying to grow. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote something about Downton Abbey about a week ago and things you could watch to kill time until season four starts. And for some reason, I've got like 50 posts about music, which makes no sense whatsoever. But it's just, it's just happened. Um, so it's, it's fairly wide-ranging. More specifically, I take things partly to generate traffic. This is one of the common strategies to get Google to notice you. So usually about eight to 10 tapes. And these are the 20 most popular tapes on the Pietist school. And some of these make perfect sense. You'd expect that there'd be about 100 posts about Pietism at something called the Pietist school. But, um, World War I, actually, I'll talk more about this later. But the, the first long series I did was walking day by day through our J-turn trip of a year and a half before we took it. I wanted to use the blog to kind of think through what, what the trip would look like. So there's a lot of mobile one on the blog as well. Um, not surprisingly, Christian colleges and Bethel come up a lot. Teaching is a pretty common topic. Evangelicalism, European history, that's well with me. The Covenant Church is my denomination, so I also feel like I'm speaking towards that audience specifically. Other than there are other things. Uh, for example, I, I'm not a U.S. historian. I have a minor field in U.S. foreign policy, but I'm not the Americanist in our department. We have two other uh, gifted scholars who do that. Talk about why there's so much of the U.S. history there. Uh, and then you've got other stuff like the church, the Bible, um, Jesus would be a really down there. Uh, and then you've got things like baseball, which is you know, self indulgence. Um, there actually is a little bit of method to this. It's not completely chaotic. This, this grows out of some things I'm trying to do. So I'll come back to this slide that yeah, talked about why the list is you know, somewhat diverse. It's not hugely diverse, but it's um, I should mention this is not the only blog I write for. 
Um, partly because I enjoyed writing a personal blog so much, I uh, encouraged slash forced our department to start a department blog in late January of 2012, what we call EC Second, after the corner of Bethel that we uh, resided in for a long time. Um, so this has uh, been up a little over a year now. Not quite as frequently uh, posted to, it's got a little under 250 posts at this point. It's a different kind of blog though. And so as you think about whether this is something you want to engage in, I don't mean this just for individual scholars. It might be useful for your department, your office, your program, your unit, your church, um, but more of an institutional blog. One thing that's distinctive is we've had students write for this blog. I tried to go through, and I think we have about 34 posts written in some way by students, usually growing out of classroom assignments. I'll talk more about that a little later on. We've also featured interviews, usually about different careers you can pursue, internships people have had, study abroad opportunities, and these are both students and alumni. Um, I've got a couple of uh, interviews pending by email with a couple of alumni, one who's a worship leader, one who works in college admissions, to continue to introduce different careers that history majors can go into. So it's it's not entirely just a faculty blog, and this has become a nice distinct product, I think. Um, past that, I think I've written maybe 190. Um, it's, it's much shorter posts, and this is much more the curator of ideas thing. I'm much more likely to put up a brief introduction and then an excerpt and a post and suggest you read further. Um, I'm going to call again Marie Koistra, who's uh, ringing up the bell pass right now. It's written about six posts as well. So um, a few people have started to dabble with this. So we average about four posts a week, but it's not quite as regular as, as the first one blog is. And here are popular categories. We talked a lot about our courses. I suggest one reason to do this is to help explain your department to prospective students and some new students. So we, we try to feature, here's what's happening in different courses, our senior seminar, modern Europe, modern America. And that's where a lot of student writing comes from. Um, but also, this is where I tend to post announcements about anything from job fairs to talks, including this one, that I've been given, uh, and news about actually hire or retirement, and a lot of that. Uh, weekend reading, I've kind of stopped doing this because it just took too much time. But on Saturdays, I try to collect a bunch of posts about history. One reason we like this idea, at least I like it, it was one way to encourage lifelong learning of our alumni. And to try to point people who've got full-time jobs, who do not have the leisure of college students and professors, to say, here's some other resources if you want to learn more about US or global or European history. So we've done that a few times. Talk a lot about careers, um, uh, museums and public history. And to point people to things happening at the Minnesota History Center, American Swedish Institute. We talked a lot about the U.S. Dakota War, and it had its 150th anniversary last year. Um, and then education after Bethel. So some of the interviews have been about graduate school, law school, seminary. So for again, people thinking past their four-year degree at Bethel, what do you do with the history of control? So here's an example of what it currently looks like. Uh, Anne Ray just wrote something. Reflecting on Black History Month, or for Modern America class, she's doing an oral history project. And to set that up, she's been trying to identify people who live, um, I think, really in the Frogtown neighborhood of St. Paul, um, to be interviewed about the history of the Civil Rights Movement and the experience of being an African American in St. Paul. And, and so, to identify people, she went to the second annual Black History Celebration at a kind of community center in Frogtown, in University of Dale, and that spurred her to write a reflection on what does this month mean. So I, I really like this idea, and I, I hope we would find time to, to reflect like this. But I you know, passed on a link to the, the, it was the video of the thing we did last Thursday as well. So this is a really typical looking page at AC7. So why should you do this? Why should you think about doing it? What are some of the benefits? And I'll start with the idea of a department blog of some sort, because I think they're um, um, one is certainly to help prospective students and their parents better understand what your department is doing, what the program is like, what the discipline is like, and what it means to be a historian, to do historical studies. And so whenever I get that list of prospects from admissions, um, I send out an email. It points to our website, but it also points to you know, interesting careers in history. Here are, here's the link to all the interviews with people who went to seminary, went to law school, or librarians, people. Um, who did a Teach for America, or who did AmeriCorps, um, doing one I mentioned with college admissions and trying to line up one with somebody who's a vice president in a corporation account. Um, so that, that's something I try then to steer prospective students and maybe their parents' importance. But also, here's what study abroad looks like if you're a history major. Here's what an internship might look like if you're a history major. Here's what our courses are like. 
So I think that's a very useful way to use the blog if you're in part of it and trying to, to help students overcome some of their lack of knowledge or their mistaken assumptions about what it means to, to use this major in this program. Um, it also, I think, is a useful way to develop uh, connections with alumni, which is something I know that all of our departments would like to do better but struggle to do. Um, but this is, thanks to social media, everything we post goes up on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. We have a LinkedIn page. We have lots of ways now to connect with alumni past sending out a newsletter once or twice a year or a group email. And um, I think a lot of what we program at this blog, this is geared in some ways to, especially a recent alumni who might not have landed on a career yet. Um, but I think we also have encountered people from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s who I think, have a fondness for our department and for our faculty. And certainly one of the biggest spikes in readership we got was when GW retired. It was a real good point of entry for a lot of alumni who had heard about this sort of landmark retirement, wanted to you know, learn more about GW, but also as a chance to get to know a department you might not have interacted much with for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it's also, and you, you can read a lot about this, um, if you read Chronicle Prior Education or Inside Prior Ed, there's a lot of discussion of how do you teach writing? You know, what kind of assignments do you use to develop skills of writing, critical thinking, reading? And there's a school of thought in our discipline and in other humanities that suggests that maybe 10 to 20 page papers are not the best mode of communication to focus on. I, I still tend to think that writing a, a good length research paper is a useful skill. And I think an important skill, I don't want to lose that. But I do think there's something about writing like a 500 to 1500 word reflection or a response of some sort. We all, a lot of us do this just as papers, but is there a benefit to maybe doing this in a blogging format? I think we've only dabbled in this. There are some professors who really build their entire course around a WordPress account. And the idea is to encourage that kind of intellectual community. So you share your responses and are be commenting on it. And in some ways, it's more organic than, say, a Moodle discussion board. It might even promote better conversation than you might have face to face. Um, so I think it's, it's helpful for developing a skill that a lot of professions would expect of, of their practitioners. You know, writing a concise response to something, synthesizing a couple of sources, reflecting on something. I think blogs lend themselves naturally to that skill. And one thing we've, we've realized, and Amy really kind of pointed this out, is that it's kind of nice for students to publish something that is widely available. Well, the first series we did was in uh, our capstone course. The senior seminar last year, I had them keep a kind of journal. They usually have a weekly assignment reflecting on the progress of their research, philosophy of history, what Christians mean by doing history. And then I would usually pick out one or two and publish them on the student's permission. They could opt out of this if they didn't want their, their thoughts um, uh, widely broadcast. One of the most popular posts we've done was by John Skeen, who was doing research growing out of his study abroad in Ghana. And he chose to write about, write about Kwame Nkrumah, the first post-colonial president of Ghana, in his response to the Cold War and his participation in the Life. And John wrote a kind of early post explaining, here's why I'm interested, here are the important ideas. And that's actually become a very popular post in people, including people from Africa, stumble across this as it comes up if you do a Google search for coming from the Cold War. It's been one of the most popular referrers to the Delta History Department. Um, and so we've done a few of these. Uh, uh, Diana did this in her American History class. I think she had five um, students uh, post on it. I think they used popular songs to illustrate some theme in American history in the 20th century. Um, I did it for Modern Europe last year. One of the options for the final project was that you could um, uh, that students could present the research as a blog post instead of as a paper. So one of the students who was up here last week with us, Amy Bergman, is a history of social studies that major, did research on a genre of film in West Germany after World War II called Schumer films, rubble films. And they're films set in the rubble of the post-war world. And they're dealing with some of the, the moral morass of Germany after World War II. And so we published it. You know, we did this privately for the, the class to do peer review on. And then I got the chance to publish it more broadly. She put up photos, she embedded a YouTube clip of what one of these films looked like. So she could do some things she couldn't do with a 10 page research paper, especially if you're using media. It lends itself very well to that. And it's a chance for her to be published, in a sense. And this is someone who's thinking about graduate school. I think this would be something she would do with her. And it helps prospective students better understand it. I think there's a broader usefulness for universities, perhaps, beyond individual departments. So I think it's also true of departments themselves. And that would be to think about your reputation. 
you are certainly talk a lot about this, especially when U.S. news rankings come out and you claim you don't have a high enough reputation with you know, other college presidents and provosts. But it's part of our strategic plan, I think, to enhance reputation. That's hard. How do you distinguish yourself from the 4,000 other schools or in the Christian college world from the 100 plus other schools who sound very similar to you, use very similar sounding distinctive language? Well, how do you get the word out about a small school in Arden Hills, Minnesota, that talks about being trapped in a bubble? Well, this is one way to do it. Um, another one of our peers is Peter Powers. He's the Dean of Humanities at Messiah College. Yeah, he has a blog called Read Right Now. He's an English scholar. And he wrote this about blogging. The claim that an institutional reputation is largely created through the faculty's online identity it startled me when I first read it. An index no doubt my deeply held and inveterate prejudice in favor of libraries, which I share, by the way, for our librarians. <laughs> Uh, but I've been trying to pound away with our faculty how utterly important our online presence is. And the internet, in many different modes, gives us the opportunity to create windows on humanities work that are not otherwise easily achieved, at least in comparison to some work done by our colleagues in the arts and the sciences. Blogging is one way of creating connection, of creating vision. And I think that with the very few exceptions, like the IVs and the public IVs, it's very much the case that your online presence matters more than any other thing you can possibly do to establish your reputation in the public eye and in the eye of prospective students and their parents. I don't want to push this too far, because I think it's also very amorphous. I don't know how you possibly, I don't know if anyone's really quantified this successfully, but I can see the point. First of all, why we push back against this. I, mean, I think we generally, especially humanities folks, tend to have this wariness about the online world. We're losing something that was distinctive of doing a liberal arts education face to face. And I, I wouldn't want to lose that. I do think, though, this is a way in which Bethel is on somewhat more equal footing than otherwise would be, in the sense that if you write well on a blog about interesting topics um, that people want to learn more about or engage you with, there's no reason you would necessarily go to a McAllister blog over a Bethel blog. You would go to a Wheaton blog over a Bethel blog. And I, I remain convinced in the quality of our faculty and our staff and our students and our alumni that they could do this. And it's a possible way to enhance the reputation of the institution. Um, just to give you a sense of you know, what kind of market this has attracted so far. This is very modest by the standards of blogging, but um, I think it's not insignificant. Um, the blue is my readership, and the red is the department readership since it started. So I you know, started the first month or so at less than 1,000 views. Um, I kind of steadily grew. <coughs> Within a year, you know, I'm regularly up now between five and 6,000 views a month, which, again, Scott McKnight gets 7,000 views a week in his blog to put this in some perspective. And this is nowhere near places like Huffington Post or the Daily Beast. You know, some of the big blogs out there that academics sometimes write for. But you know, as you know, one professor at a not especially well-known college, this is 6,000 more people, perhaps, who have heard about Bethel now than would have had I not been investing time in blogging. And I think it's well worth considering that kind of impact as well. Now, of course, um, this takes time to do, and you know, the institution that needs to decide to invest in the to back that. Um, I also think specifically for Christian colleges, it's a way of thinking uh, creatively about evangelism and witness. Um, and I will say this is not one of my primary spiritual gifts. I have a very hard time engaging in, in evangelism, but I feel like I can do the sort of evangelism of scattering seeds you know not where they're going to grow. Or um, the lectionary last week, we had Isaiah 55, 5, shall call nations that you do not know. So here are some of the nations that I've called that I certainly do not know. This is my current distribution of readers across the world. Uh, now, the United States, obviously, is, is quite popular, but that's certainly not just the Twin Cities or Minnesota. Uh, but actually, it goes quite a bit beyond the United States. About 27% of high school of readers live outside the United States. And the big ones are Britain, Canada, Australia, and English speaking. But there's a healthy number of people in Europe, certainly, but most surprising to me, hundreds from India, Argentina, Mexico, and Russia has had a fair number of readers. Um, and all told, 156 countries have had at least one reader stop by the pipe this school before, which um, you know, I don't know exactly what that means or kind of impact that had. I'm very uh, appreciative that three people from Vatican City have read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who those people are, but I'm just saying, I wonder what Benedict is doing with this guy. I'm not reading about baseball in the Pius the school. He reads my oh. I do think, again, this is a way of thinking about uh, reputation for the institution. I've heard a lot of conversations about who would be better to enhance our international profile. And this is a place where our brick and mortar location does not need to matter in the slightest will find this. Maybe if they don't even read English, they will find this through the magic of Google and such. Um, beyond this, 
think what's really important here for um, the way we present our witness is I think there's a disconnect we're all aware of between the kind of Christian community and Christian um, life and Christian thought that we experience here and I think stereotypes of Christianity that exist outside places like Bethel. Yeah, I think that we've been discussing Richard Mound's book, for example, on what convicted civility looks like. As he describes virtues of modesty and humility and curiosity and openness and thoughtfulness. I hope to some extent, not perfectly, but that does describe us to some extent. Right? You know, I've certainly have experienced that here. Is there, are those words that you think many people would attach to Christians if you just ask them on the street? It doesn't seem to come up in things like Barna surveys. Instead, it's things like hypocritical, legalistic, and hyper-political, homophobic. You know, I think this is a way that we can take, I think, what we do here, you know, take it outside of our walls, and present that kind of modest, humble, open, curious, thoughtful sort of posture to a much larger world than to ever naturally come through the doors, even for you know, chapel or vespers or a talk or to send their kids here. So I encourage us to think about our witness in that respect as well. Of course, that requires that you do it well. You can also really ruin your reputation. <laughs> So those are a few kind of institutional benefits I would suggest. And again, this all takes time. You know, to the extent that I've got any kind of sizable audience, it's because I've given up a fair amount of time to blog six times a week on a wide array of topics and to spend time trying to publicize it in different ways. And that's the choice that I've made, and it means I probably haven't done some other things. I, I've not written monographs, and I, I've done a couple of journal articles. I've done a lot of that. And that, that's a choice I'm happy with, because I really get a lot personally out of this. I also think that if there is benefit to this, institutions and their promotion and tenure committees and administrations need to recognize the benefit, saying why this is important for scholars, and it's worthy work that should be, um, should be acknowledged and rewarded. Um, when I first started doing the blogging, a lot of my goals were very scholarly and tone. One of the very first ones I said is I just need to write. I think it's something we all struggle with, because we've got so many other things. It's hard to write. A lot of us are not natural writers. Uh, so teaching is one thing, but actually putting pen to paper or you know, fingers to keys uh, is not a natural activity. But if you read any advice about writing, it's that you just have to write. You, you, you've got to practice doing it. You've got to set up a regular routine. You know, write for at least 30 minutes a day, an hour a day. This was my way of doing that and forcing myself to write, knowing that it wasn't going to end up being a 25-page journal article or a 300-page monograph would be 500 words or 1,000 words. Um, I think it's incredibly valuable writing experience. It doesn't have to be perfect either. I also committed that I would not do the same level of revision that I would normally do. You know, I, I didn't want typos up there, but I left it open that this might be a kind of work in progress, you know, be, but just for the sake of getting the writing done, I thought it was valuable. Likewise, I talked about it being kind of intellectual spring cleaning. This is how I describe it in my first post. If nothing else, I simply hope to clear out some stray thoughts, taking out mental space, expose them to the harsh light of day, and see if they look as profound on screen as they can sound in my mind. And then share it with other people so they can tell me it's actually ridiculous. We're good. I mean, I think a lot of us spend a lot of time in our heads. A lot of us are very introverted. Um, a lot of us, you know, probably help us to get these things out there and, and see what response they get and get some feedback. And so a third idea here was to start conversations and to get feedback, specifically on some of my scholarly endeavors. So I mean, a lot of my posts initially were about pietism and higher education. You know, there's not a huge you know, uh, cluster of scholars doing that kind of work, but there are people attached to that in different ways. And as one unintended consequence, you network. Um, I did a panel at the Conference on Faith and History last October that was set up almost entirely through blogging. Uh, I, I knew one of the people, but the others I had never met before, except that we read each other's blogs, commented, and emailed each other. When I came up with promotion this year, two of my recommendations came from people I met in very similar ways that I got to know very well. And then I've since added the face-to-face -face component. So I think that's something that uh, is certainly valuable as we struggle to find people who are interested in the same things we are. And as you know, travel funds are restricted, this is a way to do that as well. I think there are larger, though, repercussions for how we think about scholarship. We've got one book up here called Scholarship in the Digital Age. Uh, information Infrastructure in the Internet by Christine Borgman. There's a lot of, uh, well, there's a burgeoning amount of scholarship on digital scholarship. But I think it's worth thinking that maybe this is going to look different and as the tools change and the platforms change. Uh, one person who's written a lot about this is Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Um, I guess at Pomona College, although she moves around quite a bit. Um, she works for the MLA. 
she has uh, from blog, PlanDocsLessons.net, which is based on a book that came out with NYU Press like three years ago. Um, here's what she writes. The horror of the great city idea of taking a blog seriously as a locus of scholarly writing, or even more, the idea of taking Twitter seriously as a form of scholarly communication, reveals a serious misunderstanding of the nature of those forms, what they are, what can be done with them. There may be work that cannot be done in the form of blog posts. There may be times when the scholar can benefit from the format of the journal article or the discipline of the book, but that the blog might not be everything does not mean it is nothing. It is a mode of communication, engaging with an audience that must be taken seriously, excuse me, on its own terms. And I thought about this. There have been a few times where I've been doing some research and I thought, oh, where should I publish this? Um, over the summer, I decided to continue thinking about commemoration of World War I doing some field research at World War I memorials in Duluth, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Fort Snelling, uh, and Brighton. And that could have become something they could publish by the State of Minnesota Historical Society. I like the idea of doing a slightly less formal series of posts that would reach probably a broader audience than people who would subscribe to Minnesota history magazines. Um, and would also then connect with European commemoration, World War II commemoration. A lot of why I've done research on Christian colleges, I don't really mean to publish in Christian higher ed journals. I actually prefer to put out on a blog, partly because I don't have the time to develop the project and completion, partly because I think there's probably a wider audience who's going to read that on the blog and is going to subscribe to Christian history education. Um, one thing that can come out of this um, would be how you think about peer review. This is one of Fitzpatrick's main ideas. Because the objection is, well, how do you guarantee the quality of something that someone just posts? on the blog, and what's been suggested by some of the scholars who think about this is that you flip the, you flip the process. So when Patrick wrote Plain Ops Lessons, she put it out as open source first. It was published online without any peer review, but then she solicited comments. There was a whole structure set up through something called Media Commons, which she co-directs. And then based on that kind of peer review, NYU Press listed revisions, and then it was published in a more traditional format after the, the suggestions had come in. And there are now open source journals doing something very similar to this. So I think that's one way that you can think of blogging or something kind of like blogging. It work, still guarantee a level of quality, but maybe take better advantage of a platform of technology. I think she has a larger point to make that I especially resonate with. Open platforms like blogs and Twitter enable scholarly work to reach a broader reading public, but they also allow that broader, reader, broader, broader public to respond, a prospect that can be quite anxiety producing. But the crisis that has plagued scholarly publishing for the last several decades has in some sense been produced by the relative smallness of the audience for our work. And doing that work in the open, where it can be seen, is a crucial step. We reach out to a broader audience by encouraging intellectual exchange with readers and writers beyond the academy. We have the potential not just to help our own work in and of itself, but to help the academy more broadly in its attempts to communicate its continuing importance to contemporary society. If we're brave enough to engage directly with the public, we might have the opportunity to demonstrate a bit more about what it is that we do and why what we do matters. I think most of us here know exactly what she's talking about. But we do think we find utterly fascinating and fulfilling and inspiring. But we really struggle to explain why it's beneficial, you know, even within the academy sometimes. When we're in such narrow little niches of scholarship, it's really hard to break free of those, let alone to explain to our markets why a place like this and the kind of work that happens here is valuable. And so I think there is, again, an institutional ramification here, a personal one, the one for the academy. Kind of and in our discipline, I'd say this is really resonating strongly. Um, and just I'll give a couple examples of leading historians who are suggesting we have got to stop doing narrow scholarship for scholars on topics of ever-decreasing relevance and salience. And that would be the president of the Conference on Faith and History, Tracy McKenzie, who's the chair of the history department at Leithen. And the recent president of the American Historical Association, Ole Cronin, who's an environmental historian at UWS. So, first, McKenzie. At a conference on faith and history in October, he gave his address on the vocation of a Christian historian. And here is his chief point. We need to consider restoring Christ's second command. So, he said the first command to love God with all of your heart, your soul, but also with your mind, to really consume Christian historians. How do you cultivate the life of the mind? And that's fine, but. We need to consider restoring Christ's second command, the command to love our neighbor, to the forefront of our consciousness as we think as Christians about our scholarly vocation. Where this might lead, I'm unsure, but I don't think the answer would be business as usual, for I think it would force us to recognize and resist a host of scholarly conventions that we have too willingly accepted. The first, in many ways, the most debilitating of these would be the pervasive presumption that the only scholarship that matters is scholarship for other scholars. 
And Mackenzie's chief point that he's made a few times is that Christian historians, if nothing else, should be doing scholarship for the church, for the broader church with a capital C, but also for their local churches, first and foremost. And that's not often the kind of thing that gets rewarded by promotion of tanker committees. We're doing popular history that, that's an epithet to most professional historians that Mackenzie calls to embrace. It might be easier to do through things like blogs. When we turn our sights on that dogma, we'll come up against a host of other conventions that are entangled, kudzu-like, with this foundational maxim. I can mention them only briefly here, but to begin with, we'll need to challenge the Academy's preoccupation with innovation and shift our focus relatively toward communication. I wrote about this in my promotion essay. But as a historian, one thing that strikes me is the idea that scholarship is the production of knowledge, that you achieve mastery and expertise with a very narrow scope of human inquiry. It's a very new innovation. This is from the late 19th, early 20th century German universities. This is not how Christian scholars thought about scholarship for centuries before this. It was not producing knowledge, it was mostly transmitting knowledge, reflecting on knowledge, recovering knowledge, and conversations about knowledge, using it as a way to express devotion to God and love the neighbor. You know, what we do, it's a, it's a recent innovation. We should not just accept that as if it's the only way to do scholarship, and I think that's what Mackenzie is calling us to. And what he suggests is that instead of those kinds of skills and emphases, what we should be focusing on are things like communication, writing better, speaking better, Thinking about reaching broader audiences, about serving the church, about engaging in skills like synthesis, not just analysis, storytelling, not just explaining causation. And he really emphasized in his speech and his writing at his blog, uh, Faith in American History, um, moral reflection. But the act of reflection is something that's very difficult for most people in a post-industrial society to engage in. We are blessed with the opportunity to reflect and to converse about things. And that's not necessarily innovative. That's not necessarily producing knowledge, but it's bringing wisdom to bear, humility, um, some insight, maybe on things we're not even experts in. And that's why I like blogging, because I'm usually not writing as an expert, but not writing as if I have mastery over a field of knowledge. That's why U.S. history is my second field. I'm not an expert U.S. historian, but as a historian, I think I have something to contribute on there. I can help communicate, I can frame discussion, I ask questions, offer moral reflections on it. I think that's a valuable scholarly activity. Maybe especially for Christian scholars. But it's not a uniquely Christian insight. Here's William Cronin, um, who in a series of articles for our, for our um, Game Professional Organization's newsletter, Perspectives, wrote about rethinking scholarship. And he meant moving away from very narrow scholarship for scholars. And, and the culmination of this is talking about teaching. Especially in the digital age when the boundaries between professional and public knowledge are eroding in so many ways. But it's becoming ever more important to translate expertise into new media to reach new audiences where skills as teachers have never been more important. To produce first-rate history that reaches audiences far beyond the boundaries of our own discipline, there are a few better places to refine our craft than in the classroom with bright and experienced students who are for learning if only we can show them why it matters. What he's trying to say is what we do in the classroom is usually not innovation. It's usually not mastery. It's usually not producing knowledge. It's often going over things we've taught a million times before with people haven't thought about them before and helping them to understand that. And that's a skill we do in the classroom. And that's why <coughs> teaching it really should be at the forefront of our vocation as scholars. We have too often shifted and said the real work is producing knowledge, you know, writing journal articles and monographs. The real work is teaching, and that trains us then for the transmission of knowledge in things like blogs. So I think often it's blogging as an extension of my teaching. And a lot of my posts are bursting through the classroom wall to teach a broader audience the same kinds of things I'm wrestling with undergraduates. So if you look at the 10 most popular posts I've done, three of them are from that series of thinking through World War I. And by far the most popular is a reflection <laughs> I did on J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and how they experienced World War I. It's been viewed like 4,000 times. And it's very much a teacherly kind of post. I am not an expert on either of these people, but I've read the books and there are other resources that try to move together to help think about how do you commemorate the war, how do people mourn the war. Why is it that C.S. Lewis doesn't talk much about the war? So I use Alan Jacobs' uh, biography. But to help teach them um, why this is such a significant moment in British, European, and Western human history. And it really then helped you know, feedback into the class we taught when we went to Oxford in January. And this was all in the back of my mind. So I, I find it a hugely fruitful, productive way of rethinking my vocation, of rethinking the nature of scholarship, uh, maybe enhancing our profile much more broadly. Oh, actually, I actually did it all. So I can clearly <laughs> talk much more about it. But again, I'm so into the blog six times a week, so producing words is not going to be a problem.
we might have a minute or two if you had a question. Otherwise, a lot of times this afternoon. I have a question. How would students know what a scholarly blog, like if this is how you're using this medium, how would they be able to discern that that is a good Yeah, thing? absolutely. I mean, I mean the, most, the best way is any decent blog will have any, an about page that will tell you a little bit about who this person is and why you should be listening to them, you know, about you, their position, you know, their time, things. I mean, I think there's a tone. Some of these are actually are much more scholarly in a conventional sense, you know, sharing research very narrowly in a focus. There's actually a big discussion in the, in, out there, you know, is this academic blogging or is it blogging by academics? Is there a difference between those, mm -hmm. those two things? But, yeah, I mean, I think the about page is pretty strong. How, I guess, I probably could look at that more carefully, but how do you incorporate the scholarly blog into the citations? There are different ways to do it. I tend to just go parenthetical citations that I put link to the book on Google Books or on Amazon or a general library with the page number. Uh, if you, well you can, it's not easy to do footnotes unless you know how to, how to write code in WordPress, but you can create it in a Word document and then copy it and it will create the footnotes for you automatically. So that's how my students did their modern year posts, is they have written out a short essay with footnotes at the bottom and then got turned into footnotes. Uh, it actually functions pretty well uh, on the blog itself. Um, there are different platforms, this is just how WordPress does it. Blogger might have a different way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned a little bit about how Moodle blogs are so a bit more uh, advantageous than a Moodle forum. Talk a bit more about that. I use Moodle forums. I just use one for Tuesday when they do come to class. I created one for them to do, but you know, I just heard about that. I'm not. I, this is just based on what I've read. I, I'm not actually experimenting enough. I know that Mike's. I've met with Moodle so much, with Blackboard, I have a really hard time spurring useful discussion. I think the idea is that this might feel like a slightly less um, tried environment. It's a blog that's adapted. That it's not the only reason for its existence. Um, that, that's the argument I've heard. I don't know how convincing it is. I don't know if people have done research on relatively which produces a better discussion. Or I'm just thinking visually you can see it all at once instead of having to click on links on the, on the forum. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going far outside my own experience. Too. So probably should. I'm really intrigued with looking at responsible bloggers who raise significant questions, i.e. be a user of the search. We've talked about, are we a Christian America, is Obama a Christian president? What about the Barton series on Jefferson? I mean, and he does it responsibly and then gets John Peele. As I get pulled into this from you, I begin to understand that there is another purpose for blogging, and that is, for lack of a better term, political indoctrination. A blog has been used to spread, for example, the false understandings of Hegel's friends of Hamas. And so I'm caught between, I mean, I know if I read Nation Magazine, I'm reading an ideological framework. I know if I'm reading the Journal of Modern History, I each have somebody who screens things and work through. How do, you, how do you encourage blogging to retain a sense of academic legitimacy, or at least intellectual legitimacy? Yeah, that's why I would never say this can replace. Well, I mean, we learn these habits through other traditional structures. I mean, I think I write the way I do in a blog because in some ways, I went through a liberal arts school, I went through a graduate school because I teach at a liberal arts school, and I think that I didn't have those structures shaping me. Um, yeah, I think how you determine it, you have to learn to read these volumes. Well, you need to search to read it. I mean, you've got to read white. I mean, any good blog will have a blog call, but it can link some similar blogs. I don't think there's a quick fix to that. Okay? I think the, the, the downside is you don't have those convenient, oh, you know, well, there's a professional society that, that has you know, a shared mission and it's got expectations, and so I can trust that. Or you don't have, well, this has been peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a little bit more of a leap of faith and it requires a little bit more of you as a reader, mm -hmm. I think. And I think we all struggle with this with students who quote websites, right? And yeah. we talk about this. Well, I mean, reading is not, you know, 
And you talk about this in the department, work skills is how you read well in our objective statements. It's not just books and articles, but reading websites, reading primary sources. You, you've got to do this at the level of discernment that you can only cultivate by doing that. So I don't think I have an easy answer to that question. So I'd say, yes, you're right, but you think there's a way around it. Was, and I do a teach class because I actually do a to teach. So I do library presentations. So uh, thanks for coming.